we will deal with the topic of crystal structure today. As I had said, we finished up bonding where we looked at atoms and how their structure was, and then we looked at bonding where the atoms bond together, and now we look at how they arrange themselves in geometrical structures called the crystal structure. Fundamentally, for a crystal, a crystalline solid, all the atoms are arranged in a regular, periodic fashion. Those are the key words to remember. Okay, regular, periodic. So there is some order to the atoms in a crystal. By comparison, there are some materials like glass, which have no real order to their structure. They consist perhaps of the same atoms that are used in the crystals to create the crystal structure, but they have no order to them. And so we refer to these as amorphous. Amorphous meaning without form. Most of the materials that we use for electronic material, as electronic materials are crystalline. Though occasionally we do make use of amorphous materials, especially when it comes to oxides and things like that, that serve as insulators. But most of the materials that we will encounter in the course are crystalline materials. To understand crystal structure, perhaps the first key term that I will introduce is lattice. Lattice is simply a geometrical arrangement of points in space. There's nothing to do with any atom sitting anywhere. You can take uh, any set of points that are geometrically arranged and create a lattice. We will do something with each of these points later to create the crystal structure, but the lattice is simply the periodic arrangement of points in space. And this arrangement has got various elements of symmetry And what do I mean by symmetry? We have, for example, a mirror symmetry. You're familiar with that in everyday life. If that's a mirror and you have an object here, you will see the image over there. Okay? One is the object and one is the image. And we will say that the object is the, having the, the, the image is just a mirror reflection of the object. To give another illustration, we will say that something like this, say a rectangle, has a plane of symmetry which I indicate by this line. What does that mean? That the left part of this image here appears as if it is a reflection in a mirror of the right part of the image. Okay? This would also then be a plane of symmetry in that the top part of the image is a reflection of the bottom part of the image. So this is one of the elements of symmetry referred to as plane uh, symmetry, a mirror symmetry that we have. You can have other types of symmetry also, and all these lattices have various elements of symmetry associated with them. The second term that I will introduce is basis. I said the lattice is simply the geometrical arrangement of points in space. Now when we do something to this arrangement by putting specific collections of atoms at each of these points in the same way, then we get the crystal structure. So the basis is the set of identical, or I should say the identical set of atoms placed at each point in the lattice. The lattice is repetitive, and when you place these atoms at each of these points, or the collection of atoms, we generate the crystal structure. All right. So we can write that the crystal structure is the combination of the lattice, which has the geometrical arrangement, plus a basis. So I can take any given lattice, 
arrange different atoms on it, different collections in different ways, and generate a wide range of crystal structures. And that's what we see in nature. That the same lattice, but it has got a completely different uh, structure, simply because the basis associated with this lattice is different. We use the term unit cell which is the structural repeat unit for the lattice. The unit cell gives me all the information that I need to, need to know about a given lattice. If I know what the unit cell is and I keep on just adding it up one next to the other in three dimensions, I generate the whole lattice. So the unit cell is my smallest part of the lattice that completely defines the whole lattice. And we define this in terms of lattice constants. Which include the edge lengths. And the angles between the edges. Okay, so if we know what the edge lengths are and what are the angles between these edges, we generate the unit cell which when repeated in 3D gives me the whole lattice. So typically we will define it in terms of A, B and C which are the edge lengths and then we have alpha, beta and gamma which are the angles between these. I will uh, flesh that out a little more later when we look at actual examples. But these are what are called lattice constants or lattice parameters. Now it may appear that there are so many different shapes that a cell could take. And while that is true, we can't arbitrarily take any shape and fill three-dimensional space, which is what a solid is. So there, it turns out that there are only seven crystal systems. That means these are seven unique shapes which can be used to fill 3D. All right? So they are called the seven crystal systems. And we will look at each of them in turn. Let's begin with the simplest, cubic. And the cubic cell is defined by its constants, where we'll write A is equal to B is equal to C. And then as you already know, alpha is equal to beta, is equal to gamma, is equal to 90 degree. That means all the edges are perpendicular to each other. Very simple. All right. We have a cube. And the edge length then are given by the A, B, and C. I should define the B here. Okay, forget these. So the edge length, this length is A, this is B, this is C, and in this case, in the cubic case, they all turn out to be equal. How do we define our angles? The angle sort of between B and C is what is called alpha. The angle between A and C is beta, so it will come opposite to this B. And then the angle between A and B is gamma. That's how we are defining the lattice parameters. So this is the simplest case of cubic symmetry, a cubic lattice, and uh, there are variations of this as we will see later. The next one we can look at is tetragonal. And in this is defined as A is equal to B as before, but we've reduced one of those symmetrical elements there that it's now C axis is of a different length than the B axis. The angles all remain at 90 degrees. All right? So now you have an extended structure. Okay? Where now my A and B are the same, but the length of C is different from the length of A and or do it here, B. 
All right? So this is what is called the tetragonal lattice. The next one is the orthorhombic lattice, where again one further element is reduced in its symmetry in that A is not equal to B is not equal to C. All the uh, lattice edges, the cell edges of different lengths, while we still maintain the angular positions at 90 degrees. You can draw that for yourself, where now the cell lengths are different, but the angles remain at 90 degrees. The fourth one is the rhombohedral. where we define it, the lengths are the same, but the angles are not 90 degree. You can see how this is progressing. When we started with the cubic, we had all the lengths the same, all the angles 90. Then we moved on to the tetragonal, where we had the lengths, two of them are same, one is not, and the angles are 90 onto the orthorhombic where now all the lengths are different while maintaining the angles. And now we've moved to another one where the lengths are the same, but the angles are not 90 degrees. I'm not going to draw these all out. They are fairly basic information that I'm providing here by way of review. And then another one is the hexagonal, where A is equal to B, but C is of a different length than either A or B. And now our angles alpha is equal to beta is 90 degree, gamma is equal to 120 degrees. So if you look at the axes, we have A is equal to B, and this is C is a different length. The angle gamma is 120 degrees, but both A and C, that angle is 90, and so are B and C. And so when you repeat this unit around, you get the hexagonal structure. Further reductions in symmetry occur as we go down the, down the list. We come to the sixth one, which is the monoclinic, where A is not equal to B, is not equal to C. So now all the three lengths are different, and the angles, two of them, are 90 degrees but the third one is not. Okay? So here we have A is not equal to B, is not equal, lengths are different, but two of the angles are still 90, while one is not. And the final one, where nothing is equal, and the angles are, none of them are 90 degrees. So we have the lowest symmetry here, and in cubic case, we had all the highest symmetry there. So gradually, in the seven crystal systems, we see a reduction in the symmetry. Now, in addition to these seven crystal systems, what we have to look at is how are the atoms going to be arranged within these systems? There could be variations. So when you consider these variations, it turns out that there are 14 lattices that are based on these seven crystal systems that can be used to describe all the crystal structures. These are the only possible 14 lattices. And they are referred to as the Brave lattices. Okay. For example, what I mean to illustrate, say in the case of the cubic case, the crystal system is cubic. And when I look at it, I could have either a simple cubic structure where there's one atom associated with each corner, what we call our simple cubic, or I could do something different and have a body-centered cubic. Both of them belong to the cubic system, but in this case, there is a difference. There's one more atom in the center. Now note that the atom in the center is identical to the atoms in the corner. Then only is it a body-centered cubic structure. Okay? Just because you have any atom in the center of a cube doesn't make it a body-centered cubic lattice. Okay? So while both of these 
are part of the cubic crystal structure, crystal system, they are both different lattices. And you can work your way through this to see a third case, the face centered cubic. I will show you a few models in a second. Okay, we have all of these atoms at the edges, at the corners as before, except now we are going to stick one atom at the face centers. All right, so each of the face centers has, and again, all of these atoms are identical with each other. And so this is called the face-centered cubic, or FCC, face-centered cubic. That's the simple cubic, and that's the BCC, or the body-centered cubic. All elementary things. And so when we look through this, we can generate a list of the 14 Bravais lattices. I gave you three already. The uh, simple cubic the body-centered cubic, the face-centered cubic. I'm not elaborating those. And then you can have simple tetragonal. Body-centered tetragonal. In the case of orthorhombic, we can have simple orthorhombic. Body-centered orthorhombic. <coughs> face-centered orthorhombic, okay, I'm sorry, not body-centered, I used the wrong term, the base-centered, that uh, BC there refers to base-centered orthorhombic. So we have orthorhombic simple, base-centered orthorhombic, and then face-centered orthorhombic. And then you have rhombohedral, Right up here, hexagonal. And two variations of the monoclinics. Simple monoclinic. Base-centered monoclinic. And finally, the triclinic. So these are what are referred to as the 14 Bravais lattices. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Have I left out one? body-centered, simple orthorhombic, the appears I have. Which one have I missed out? Okay, I'll come back to that. Hold on. I'll just leave it there, that thought. But there are 14 of these. I, I don't know which one I've missed. I'm looking in the list. But I'd like to show a few models of these just to illustrate the point. Say, for example, we'll start with the body-centered case. And you can see that the end uh, atoms are there. And along with it, there is an atom at the body center. Okay? So the eight atoms at the, at the corners and one atom in the center. And we call that the body-centered lattice. Let me give another example. This one is the face-centered lattice, okay? Where again, now we have at the four corners, I mean, at the eight corners, we have atoms, and then at each center of the face, we have uh, atoms that are identical to the ones at the corner. Here's the case of a tetragonal, that is, end the base-centered tetragonal. Okay, we have uh, eight atoms there. You can see the tetragonal structure. These two lengths are equal, but the C-axis is different. And then you have uh, atoms at the two bases, these two points. Okay? So that is base-centered. We have one here and one right at the bottom there. All right? I'll show another one. That's the face-centered tetragonal. You can see now, again, it's the tetragonal structure, but the different faces have got an atom each. Now, 
This is what is called, we'll come to packing in a second and I'll come back to that. But for now, these are the ones that we have. Okay? Did we note which one we missed out? Base centered tetragonal. All right? Base centered tetragonal. That is this one. That was the one which had the tetragonal structure and then two atoms at the base. That's the one I had missed out earlier. Okay, so that gives us the list of Bravais lattices and all the crystal structures that we encounter in these electronic materials uh, deal with these sort of 14 lattices. Nowadays, people are talking of uh, some variations uh, that are called uh, quasi-crystals where some other uh, five-fold symmetry is seen. But uh, that is a very recent phenomenon. Fundamentally, everything else can be explained in terms of these 14 Bravais lattices. Now, as I told you, the lattice by itself is there. Now, we have to put collections of atoms, which are called the bases, to make this into crystal, crystal structures. Let's look at some specific structures that we will encounter in uh, electronic materials. The face-centered ones we just saw is very common in many of the metals, copper, aluminum, gold, silver, nickel, palladium, many of these appear in the face-centered structure. We had that earlier, the face-centered structure, so I'm not going to redraw that. Okay? We can create now, uh, if you want to look at it, what we will call the close-packed structures. What do I mean by that? I'll illustrate in a second. In other words, there's the face-centered structure is a close-packed structure and what we mean by that is that most of the space within a close within a, a face centered structure is occupied by atoms okay this is one structure where 74% of the unit cell is occupied by atoms we can calculate this maybe i'll give it as an exercise for you to calculate this you probably have done it at some time and basically we can see that it consists of layers of atoms that are stacked one on top of the other Particularly in the face-centered case, by looking at a sort of structure like I illustrated in the model, it may not be obvious, but actually the atoms touch each other along the face diagonal. All right? In the structure that I showed you, you don't see that happening. They're all shown distinctly like that. But in reality, in the face-centered structure, we have all these atoms touching along these diagonals. And what we can say is we know that this is the atomic radius. They're all equal atoms, though the middle one looks a little smaller. They're all the same. And so we know that this length is 4R, where R is the radius of a particular sphere. And we know that this distance here is what we call our lattice constant A. So it is obvious that we can draw a simple uh, relationship between A and R since we know that the atoms touch along the face centers. And you get then that A is equal to 2 root 2 R. All right? You have four R's here, and you got an A here, and that's 4 R. So you get A squared plus A squared is equal to 4 R squared, which you then express in terms of A. So very simple. So we have, if we know what the radius of the sphere is, we know the lattice constant. If we know what is the lattice constant, we can calculate what the radius of the sphere of these, of these atoms should be, which are FCC. Another point to illustrate will be the number of atoms per unit cell. In the case of the FCC, I'll bring back the model for you to see. You will look at it and say, you just count up one, two, three like that, and there's uh, eight plus six, 14 atoms. But uh, that's not the correct answer because some of these atoms are shared with adjacent unit cells. We have to remember that there is another unit cell right next to this, another one on this side, another in front, and so on, and below and up. So what we have to do is to think this particular atom, let's say, or any of these, uh, the corner ones, for example, are shared with how many other unit cells? Eight other unit cells are shared. So, and then the face ones are shared by how many? By two. And if we had, let's say, just to continue the analogy, a, an atom in the center here, it would belong solely to this unit cell. It's not shared. 
So when we determine the number of atoms per unit cell, what we have to do is to go and look. There are eight corner atoms shared with eight cells. So their contribution, so to say, to this unit cell is one-eighth, and we have one atom there. There are six face-centered atoms shared with two, and we have three of these. So a total number per unit cell turns out to be four, which is characteristic of FCC structures. And similarly, you can do for other structures. Another close-packed structure that we have is what is called the hexagonal close-packed structure. And the interesting thing is that even in this case, the packing ratio <coughs> excuse me, is 74%, just like in the FCC case. Okay? The amount, the volume of uh, the unit cell that is occupied by the atoms turns out to be 74% in this case. A simple example would be the metal zinc. And we can visualize this in terms of atoms all lying in a plane touching each other. You can do this very easily by using table tennis balls or something of that nature. Lay them all out, and if we lay it all out in a layer, we get this kind of a thing. Now we have a choice. I can, when I stack my next layer on top of this, I have a set of choices. Either I will put them here. So if there is one sitting here, a large one, you cannot put one there, so we skip and we have one here, uh, one here. That's one choice. And another choice would be that I could choose, let's say, this set. Okay? So there are two different possibilities here. So if we call the first layer as layer A, these big atoms as layer A, and then the, the purple ones that I've sketched in there, uh, this one, this one, and this one, as layer B, and so on, and the green ones as C, I now have a choice. They will repeat as either A, B, A, B, or they may repeat as A, B, C, A, B, C. Okay? And it turns out that this A, B, A, B sequence of repeating, one layer on top of the other, is what gives us our hexagonal close pack structure, and the A, B, C, A, B, C gives us the face-centered cubic close pack structure. All, all very simple, basic things. All right, and I will illustrate that. You can see that in the case very easily for the hexagonal close pack structure here. You can see that. Uh, can we look at it in front here? The it, okay, the red and the yellow are A and B layers, and so there is a repeat that you can see. If that red is the A, then you have the B layer that is uh, the yellow one. Then again an A, then a B, and then again an A. So that's the A B A B stacking sequence that I just mentioned. When we look at the uh, FCC structure, that sequence doesn't seem as obvious. What you have to do is to train yourself to look a different way at this along what we will refer to as the 111 direction or the body diagonal. Okay, let's see if I can show that to you. Uh, it's difficult to show, but if you think of it, you're looking perpendicular along this body diagonal, all right, from this atom to this atom here. And what we have got to do is to try to think in terms of layers that are perpendicular to this. And you'll see then that there's one layer that consists of this atom and a whole layer of atoms along here. Then there's another layer, it's rather difficult to see here, that will consist of these atoms here. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you'll have another layer that is this, this, these six, and then another layer. So it is really stacking this way. And when we look, break it up in colors, you'll see that it'll be A, B, C, and then back again to the A on the top there. It's uh, difficult to illustrate with a, a simple uh, red colored thing here. Maybe some other time I'll show um, the different colored ones for you to see. But uh, that's basically how you have to visualize it along the 111 direction, as we say, or the body diagonal. One other very interesting crystal structure for us is the diamond crystal structure. From the name, it might be obvious that diamond has this structure. <coughs> Excuse me. 
But in addition, two very important materials also have the structure, silicon and germanium. Silicon, as we know, is perhaps the most important semiconductor material, and germanium used to be one of the very important early semiconductors, and gradually it has changed, and silicon took over. Now again, as I say, there is a change. There people are coming back to mixtures of silicon and germanium called silicon-germanium alloys, which are making a great uh, impact on the industry. But this and this, two key things, and diamond also, all have the structure. What does the structure look like? It's going to be difficult to illustrate, but fundamentally you can start with an FCC lattice. Oops, I uh, blew that. All right. I'm going to draw the atoms in at the corners first. So we have a simple cube case here. Just ignore this line over there. And then we fill in the uh, face centers. They're all the same atoms. Okay? So, so far it's just looking exactly like the face centered atoms. Now we have, we can put in four more atoms inside this structure. If you will imagine the body diagonal that goes from here through here, we will put one atom halfway between the center and here, about there, somewhere there. Okay? Quarter, quarter, quarter is the, how the notation will go. And opposite to it, we will have one over here, along this diagonal. That connects these two ends. All right? And then, in the lower area, there's t t in, uh, near these atoms, we don't have anything. So there's just these two. And then opposite to it, along the other two body diagonals, we'll have one in here and one somewhere about here. So in addition to the face-centered atoms that are already there, the corner atoms that are there, we have four other atoms that are part of this lattice that creates the diamond lattice. Though I drew it in with a slightly different color here, I don't know if you can see the color, these four atoms, they're all actually the same atoms. And so diamond means all these atoms, the corner, the face centers, and the ones inside are all carbon atoms. If it's silicon, then in that case we have silicon atoms at all these points. Okay? So in this case, what will be the unit cell? It's tempting to think that it's face centered. <coughs> Excuse me. Right? It looks like it's face-centered, but if you, because of the presence of these other atoms there, if I take a face-centered lattice and repeat it, I will not get it. So what I'm ending up with actually is just a simple cubic lattice. But the basis is different. All right? Uh, it will be, uh, be a cubic lattice with different uh, basis. Sometimes people refer to this kind of a structure as two interpenetrating FCC lattices. Uh, if you try to sketch out more of these unit cells, you can see that clearly. This is one FCC, and then you have these other atoms here, these four, and you draw other unit cells as if that's another FCC, and two of them sort of merged into each other. They're called interpenetrating lattices. The number of atoms per unit cell in this case? We have the same number as an FCC, which is four, and then you have four more that are right in there. So we have eight atoms per unit cell over here. Okay? And one more structure that is based exactly on the diamond structure is called the zinc blend structure. Zinc blend is a mineral name for zinc sulfide. And uh, it can appear in different forms, what is referred to as polymorphism. I will not go into it, but just to say that zinc sulfide could have the same chemical formula, one atom of zinc and one atom of sulfur, but it could have different crystal structures, one of which 
is the zinc blend structure and the other is what is called the wurtzite structure. So they're both zinc sulfide, but they have different crystal structures and as a consequence, they have different properties. We'll focus on this structure, zinc blend. Many compound semiconductors, we saw that in the case of silicon and uh, diamond and germanium, which are elemental semiconductors, they have the diamond structure. Essentially, the zinc blend structure is found in compound semiconductors like gallium arsenide, which is very uh, important semiconductor. You can find it in silicon carbide, which can again exhibit the same kind of behavior as zinc sulfide. You find it in many different forms with the same formula. You can have gallium nitride having the zinc blend structure. Many of these are there. What is this zinc blend structure? I'll come back to this figure. In the case of the diamond crystal structure, we had that all these atoms were identical. If it's diamond, it's all carbon. All we do here in the zinc blend structure is we leave the corner atoms the same. We leave the face-centered atoms as they are, but all we do is we play with the atoms that are inside. So I'm going to redraw them a little bigger here so you can see the difference there. Okay? So the ones that are sitting along these body diagonals are of a different element than the ones that are at the corners or at the face centers. So when we have a structure like this, that is what is referred to as the zinc blend structure. So in the case of gallium arsenide, we could picture it as gallium atoms, for example, occupying all the corners and the face center, sorry, And then when we extend it, the arsenic atoms occupying along the body diagonal. Okay, I'm not drawing in all the atoms, but we have arsenic there, and we have arsenic there, and then arsenic here, and one on the other side. Okay. So in this case, the, the purple, what I shaded in here, is the arsenic and the blues are the gallium arsenide. There's one final structure, uh, two, two quick structures, sodium chloride. We find this, it's called the rock salt structure. And we see it as uh, named in the sodium chloride, MgO, lithium fluoride, and so on. It's an ionic kind of uh, material, all these. And so we have ions that are arranged along this structure. Let me see if I can draw that for you. Okay. Let's begin by putting, say, fluorine ions at the corners. We'll also have fluorine ions at the face center, for example. Okay. It's going to overlap a little bit, but you can figure it out. So face centers have got fluorine ions, and the corners have fluorine ions. And now we have a different ion, the lithium ion, that is in this edge position. Okay. So fluorine, the large, and then we have lithium, which is small. Typically, you'll find that the negatively charged ion is larger. Do you know why? When there's another electron that is added, the same charge is now distributed over a larger number of electrons. So it spreads out. Okay? 
So that is where we demonstrate the positive charge as a smaller one and the negative charge by a larger one. So in this case, again, you have corner atoms, the fluorine. The face centers are fluorine. But at the edge centers, in each case, we've got the lithium structure, the lithium atoms there. One last one is called the cesium chloride structure. Okay, CS is the uh, name for cesium, symbol for cesium. And as before, we'll have chlorine atoms that are larger, chlorine ions, I should say. And you have cesium smaller. All right? And in this case, it is uh, very simple. It's exactly like the body-centered case of cubic, with the difference that the atom at the center of the body is different from the atom at the corners. So we have the corner atoms all of chlorine, but we have a different kind of atom at the body center. So this is not body centered in its unit cell, as I mentioned earlier, because body centered, the lattice has to be, all the atoms are same. So even though there is an atom at the body center, this is really a simple cube. All right? Okay. Now, there are other kinds of atoms also that we can have. Uh, I will not go into it, other kinds of uh, crystal structures. But another common one I'll mention in passing is the woodsite, which I told you earlier for zinc blend, that it exists in both the zinc blend structure and the woodsite structure. The zinc blend structure is related to a cubic lattice. The woodsite structure is based on the hexagonal lattice. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, it is basically something like this that you saw earlier, except now you'll have to think in terms of bilayers. That means this red itself that we are seeing here, okay, imagine that it's actually two atoms together. For example, that it is zinc and sulfur. One bilayer of zinc and sulfur together is the A position. The yellow consists of another bilayer of zinc and sulfur, and then again, and these are all repeating A, B, A, B, A, B. Okay, so instead of single atoms like this, imagine that they are bilayers that are repeating A, B, A, B, A, B. Very important nowadays, a uh, number of the important semiconductors that we are using have this sort of a structure, either the woodside structure or the zinc blend structure. Two, uh, two atoms in a layer, that's why we call them a bilayer. Okay? Um, yeah, please. Pardon? Please, I don't need to uh... Okay. Let's take the simple case of... Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, one that I'm more familiar with, silicon carbide, for example. you got... The way these are arranged is as a tetrahedral kind of structure, okay? And then there's one more line there. Okay, the silicon atom in the center, bonded to four carbon atoms. Now, if you imagine, the silicon is sitting at the center of this base triangle. And, of course, in the adjacent to it, there is another silicon, and then there's more of this. And if you extend that into two dimensions, you've got a sheet that consists of carbon atoms, this base layer, these three, and so on. And then there's silicon atoms located at a certain height above this base layer in the center of this triangle. If you treat that bilayer, that those two, the silicon and the carbon together as if it's one layer, that's the concept of the bilayer. And then again, you see this, this carbon atom on top, it's there. We can go and extend it out further, and the same thing will come. There will be silicon atoms on top of it, and so carbon, silicon, again, another bilayer is there. So it is the repeat sequence of these things that creates the woodside structure or the zinc blend structure. Okay? Another basic thing that I would quickly define and go on, defining directions and planes. Again, perhaps many of you are familiar with this, but as I said, the first few lectures will be more by way of review. Now, when we start talking about atoms inside a plane, and inside, a, inside a structure, I will say it is this atom or that atom, and you may say something else. We have to have some common vocabulary to indicate which atom we are talking about. 
or which direction we are talking about or which plane we are talking about. And the common way of indicating that is by using what are known as Miller indices. All right. What we do is that we define axes x, y, and z. They don't have to be perpendicular to each other, depending on the particular crystal structure. And then we place our unit cell over there. So now, this length here is A, this length is B, and this length here is C. Now, as you see, I'm using terms like this length and that length because you can see what I'm doing. But if I were just talking to you, I would have to have a way of referring to what I'm talking about, which direction am I pointing in. And so the way to go about it is we look at... We, uh, we uh, assign numbers, integers, for each of these directions at what length or what fraction of the unit cell length uh, we, are, we are making the pointing, uh, we are pointing to. Say, for example, I'm pointing here. That is at unit length of A along the x-axis. Okay? So the way we would indicate this in Miller indices is this particular direction, which is just simply along the x-axis, is, is at, uh, uh, the vector, for example, is at 1A, 0 along the B, and 0 along C. So this axis would then be defined as 1, 0, 0. And we indicate the directions by putting the following brackets around it. Okay. Similarly, this along Y, I would call it 0, 1, 0, and along Z, then, would be called 0, 0, 1. What if it is in the negative direction? I could have it along the negative direction. In that case, we use the term bar 1, for example. Okay? That's not a T. Bar 1. And so, the complementary directions to the ones that I listed here would be bar 1, 0, 0, 0, bar 1, 0, and 0, 0, bar 1. All right? So we can indicate negative. And the whole family, they're all very similar. It's just a matter of uh, how I define my axis. So this whole family of planes can be defined uh, as a different set of brackets that we're using, as you can see. Sorry, I shouldn't use those because I'll use those later. This refers to the family of directions. So whenever I just use 1, 0, 0 with these brackets, I'm referring to this whole set. Okay? And then we can also do the same with planes in a similar way. All right? That's x, y, and z. And if I want to refer to a particular plane, let's say this one here, the first thing I would do is to indicate where it is cutting this axis. That's what I'm interested in. So if I ask you, where does this plane cut the x-axis, the answer would be, it doesn't. So we would indicate that by saying that along the x-axis, it cuts it at infinity. The y-axis is cut where? at zero, but actually it's a matter of opinion where I put my origin. So if, if I can shift it and I say it cuts it at one, and where does it cut the z-axis? Again at infinity. Now what do I do? I take the reciprocals of these. So this is the intercepts on each axis. Then I take the reciprocals, and I get zero, one, zero. All right? So in this case, my index for this plane is zero, one, zero. And I would indicate that in general by putting these sort of brackets around it. And if there are fractions, then we will convert that to the integers before we put the brackets. And uh, as before, when we are talking of a family of planes, then I will put a different set of brackets. This is the family of planes. Okay? 
So similar to the previous case, we have. Now note that in this case, say for example, 0, 1, 0 is not the same as 0, 2, 0. Because 0, 2, 0 will lie, remember we've taken reciprocals here. So it will lie halfway between these two. So as in the case of direction, 0, 0, 1 is the same as 0, 0, 2. But in the case of planes, 0, 1, 0 is not the same as 0, 2, 0. So we have to be careful with this uh, directions and planes when we um, work with them. Okay? So we can work out a number of different uh, problems for different types of uh, planes and directions. The only thing you have to be cautious about, I'll just add one word here, is that in the case of hexagonal lattice, we use what is called the Brave-Miller notation for simplicity. I'll just illustrate it very quickly. That instead of using this only these three axes, we give a fourth axis here. So this is the base, okay, the hexagon. How many do I have? Okay, so these are the axes, one, two, and three. And I call them A1, A2, and A3. And this is now C axis. And uh, A1, A2, and A3 all lie in this plane. And so now I have four numbers to indicate directions and planes. A simple rule to remember is H plus K is equal to minus I. And this is what is a convenient notation for hexagonal crystals. So we'll leave it at that and uh, take up some other topics in the coming lecture.